there with partners in the University of Dar es Salaam um, and the University of East Anglia in the UK. Um, so we're, we're one year into the project, um, which means that this is a very sort of informal presentation on the participatory methodology and some of our initial data and results. It's not a fully finished, fully formed um, analysis. Um, but because we're now moving into year two and three, if you have feedback, um, it would be very <coughs> gratefully received. So what is the ecosystem approach to fisheries management? Um, at the conceptual and policy level, um, it's the food and agricultural organisation, the FAO, who are most strongly developing and advocating um, this approach. So their definition states that an ecosystem approach to fisheries strives to balance diverse societal objectives by taking into account the knowledge and uncertainties about biotic, abiotic, and human components of ecosystems and their interaction, and applying an integrated approach to fisheries within ecologically meaningful boundaries. So a fairly opaque kind of um, definition of, of what they're trying to do here. Um, a review of their technical documents indicates that um, it's a very normative or sort of idealistic approach to this. So there's a little practical experience um, underpinning the, the full framework that they're suggesting. Um, it's a response to single species management. So it aims to look at other target species, um, non-target species, habitat effects, and this big black box of social um, dimensions. Um, it generally comes from the natural sciences. Um, but it's aiming to retain a lot of the sort of concepts and things we've learned from the social sciences in terms of um, participation, precautionary principle, um, adaptive governance, and so on. Um, it's based on a conventional cycle of planning, implementation, and evaluation, even though it aims to be adaptive. So again, in the technical documents, you can find these very elaborate implementation frameworks of how exactly you should implement an ecosystem approach to fisheries management. Um, and these are generally uh, very much underpinned by a lot of scientific data. So to get at all these other target species, habitat effects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Although the FAO do acknowledge that uh, that traditional knowledge and participation of stakeholders is important. Now, despite the fact that there's little practical evidence of success of the full kind of framework. Um, the FAO and, and the EU are advocating this very strongly in policy across um, fisheries, um, particularly in, well, including in developing countries. Um, it was designed in response to single species management, but in most of these places it's being applied on top of existing governance frameworks, so community-based co-management, um, integrated coastal area management, and so on. So there's a lot to learn about what it actually offers if you're if you're not applying it to a blank slate. Um, and although it's very sort of um, dependent on a lot of scientific data in its most normative sense, um, it's applied in a lot of contexts where 
there is quite low uh, capacity for, for resources and for management and low data capability. Um, so what does the what does the scientific literature say about this this approach? Now, um, a quick clarification here. Uh, there's a lot of literature on ecosystem-based management, which focuses almost exclusively on marine spatial planning and marine protected areas. But the um, um, but the ecosystem approach to fisheries management comes from quite a different. I don't know if you can perched on a table. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the fisheries-based management approach is quite a different um, origin. However, there's a large amount of, well, there's some literature which uses EBM or ecosystem-based management in a much broader sense, so to include marine spatial planning, um, <coughs> ecosystem approach to fisheries management, and then other ideas like ridge to reef or, or land-sea connections. And it's this kind of literature which we can learn something from for, for EAFM. Um, so there was this review by um, Aswani, which considers the potential of an ecosystem-based management approach in tropical context. Um, so he looked at the Pacific, Southeast Asia, East Africa, and the Caribbean. And they argue that um, ecosystem-based management does provide some unique benefits, but it's best thought of as an expansion of existing approaches. So customary management in the Pacific, co-management in places like East Africa, uh, and ICM in places like the Philippines. Um, similarly, Patrick Christie and others did a review of um, initial attempts to implement an ecosystem-based management approach in Caribbean, um, Hawaii, Philippines, and West Africa. Um, and they also suggest that um, the ecosystem-based management emerges incrementally from existing practice. But they do acknowledge that this may be counter to the kind of desires of a lot of people that are, uh, are advocating the approach. Um, in contrast, uh, Fibrit Berkey's, um, through a conceptual review of ecosystem-based fisheries management and ecosystem-based approaches, suggests that you need a revolutionary, not an evolutionary approach. Um, but in doing so, he advocates a whole range of other normative governance frameworks which have also not necessarily been tested in practice. Um, and he focuses a lot on the sort of more social dimensions of these frameworks. So things like primary management, rights-based management, um, adaptive management, <clears throat> this new idea of ecosystem stewardship and so on and so forth. Um, so it's within this kind of context of uncertainty about what an ecosystem approach to fisheries management can really offer small-scale fisheries management um, in developing countries that World Fish proposed and developed this uh, action research project. Um, the overall objective is to kind of look at whether an ecosystem approach can help improve small-scale fisheries management in these contexts um, and whether it can enhance their contribution to poverty reduction. Now, each of the countries that we're working in has a different... Um, starting point, so they all have slightly different um, governance institutions in place. So one of the first specific objectives is to look at what those institutions are and how the EAFM may build on that. Then, because of the normative nature of this framework, um, the second objective is to look at um, the sorts of strategies which are suitable for these kind of contexts, um, rather than the sort of ideal suite of um, and the third is to uh, strengthen the capacity of local fisheries stakeholders and government agencies to work within these sorts of ideas. So we do this within the project through its participatory approach and through the uh, involvement of, of stakeholders in research design. So in Tanzania, for example, um, we have a, a district fisheries officer and a district NGO representative who come to all of our project planning and research design meetings. Um, there are a set of research questions that are sort of go alongside these project um, objectives. Um, so how does the EAFM align with existing governance frameworks? Um, that's looking at whether some of these principles are already encompassed in co-management, for example, integrated coastal area management. Um, what new institutions you might need if you took on a sort of normative uh, EAFM. Um, 
are these feasible within current policy and legislation in some countries? And are they feasible within um, broader approaches of government um, decentralization? So if we're moving to smaller scales of management, which has been the kind of trend for the last 10, 20 years, um, what does that mean if you're now trying to expand up to um, wider ecosystem um, ideas and concepts and including more different sort of social objectives? Um, which kind of management strategies are appropriate and where are the synergies and trade-offs between these tools? And then um, as the scope and scale of management uh, increases, who are the winners and losers in an ecosystem-based approach? So both at the community level and changing dynamics at sort of district and national level between agencies. Um, and just to reiterate, I guess, these questions are kind of asked with the contribution of small-scale fisheries um, to poverty reduction in mind. So it's not a conservation project. It's much more about uh, fisheries sustainability and equity, um, equitable distribution of benefits. So I've referred to this as a participatory action research project. Um, by action research, I mean in simple terms that um, part of the project is designed around interventions, um, and then research uh, happens alongside that. Um, and by participatory, obviously, that it involves stakeholders in research design and the activities that take place. Now, Wellfish in 2007 developed this participatory diagnosis and adaptive management framework, which can be used as a research framework or an implementation framework. Um, it begins with this participatory diagnosis um, phase, which recognises that basically you can't assume that all small-scale fisheries are the same, that they face the same problems, and that they have the same kind of opportunities and capabilities for governance. Um, so it wants to start by asking questions about the specific characteristics of the fishery that you're aiming to manage. Um, so this kind of ties in with ideas of um, going beyond panaceas developed by Eleanor Ostrom um, and others. Um, so basically in the FAO documents, um, they suggest that uh, ecosystems are generally spatially defined, but that they can exist at the scale of a single coral colony to an ocean. So you can't pre-assume uh, the level at which you're going to be working. So one of the first questions is then about defining your fishery ecosystem. So what scale um, are you working at for your focal system? Um, the second step is then to identify the specific threats and opportunities which characterise your fishery. Uh, well fish have developed uh, what they call this diagnosis radar. Um, and very simply, it just reminds us to um, consider all the different aspects of your fishery system. So the ecosystem, people and livelihoods, governance and institutions, and external drivers. Some research by Dave Mills has used this in survey-type research in West Africa. Um, we are using it very much within a participatory workshop setting. So we focus simply on those kind of four dimensions. It's very broad entry points to, to what we're doing. Um, the third step within the, the participatory diagnosis is then to um, prioritise management uh, issues and actions. Um, so this uh, methodology uh, aims to be, uh, so, so that we have a single methodology across four countries, but so that we can ask specific questions that relate to each fishery. So each fishery would then have actions that are specific to it. Okay. Um, one of the project sites is Tanzania, and I just want to give a very brief overview of the sort of policy context in Tanzania. Um, the project started with a set of, uh, sort of uh, inception meetings with a bunch of different stakeholders. Um, and historically, Tanzania did have, or was based on single species um, fisheries management paradigm which is quite surprising for a multi-species inshore fishery. Um, but it was very much focused on investment and development of, of the fishery. So they suggested that um, the MSY in Tanzania for, for the inshore fishery would be 730,000 tonnes, but they hadn't yet achieved that. Um, and so they put in a lot of investment in technology and so on, only to discover that subsidies, etc., were unsuccessful. 
so they recognise that probably they're looking at overexploited fisheries and they'd already fallen over the other side of the curve, essentially. So for the last um, sort of 10, 15, 20 years, they've been looking more at co-management and decentralisation, um, implemented through beach management units which were adapted from Lake Victoria. So many of you will be familiar with Josh's work on BMUs in Kenya and a very similar strategy is used in Tanzania for co-management. And that's been legislated in all their uh, policy documents. So there is a high a recognition that, that integrated management is needed, so either through integrated coastal area management or these ideas of an ecosystem approach to fisheries management. Um, but because they're still trying to institutionalise co-management, in Tanzania they, they would prefer that these are sort of tested practically and in implementation, uh, not put into policy before we know whether, whether there's potential for them. So they asked us, uh, as well, not to touch policy and to focus on um, looking at local scale governance and how that can interact and perhaps support an ecosystem approach to fisheries management. Um, in these discussions with government, they recommended a research site just north of um, Dar es Salaam. Uh, this is kind of a lagoon with uh, about seven um, predominant communities. Um, and there have been various project interventions in here previously. So um, USAID have been in there trying to implement sort of community-owned um, sanctuaries around individual reefs. Um, the World Bank have been in there helping to implement BNUs and providing lots of boats and nets, um, which are said to be very problematic. Um, the Norwegians are in there trying to do some ecosystem based fisheries management on, on pelagic fisheries and so on. So it's a site that has seen a lot of project in, intervention before, um, but also a lot of ending of initiatives and not much taken up into government um, subsequently. Uh, a very brief background of the case study area. Um, five communities are traditional settlements, another two were um, administrative posts set up through various colonial governments. Um, these are now turning into um, sort of peri-urban sites as Dar es Salaam kind of expands up and Bagamoyo town expands around these communities, which has a lot of implications for the sorts of issues that those communities are facing. Um, the rest remain uh, rural communities. Um, when you talk to elders, everyone is an immigrant, but it depends on when they arrived and, and for what reason. Um, and although they are heterogeneous in this, um, they're all considered to be sort of coastal people. Um, 70 to 80 percent of men and women are involved in the fishing industry, um, but there are a range of other livelihood activities um, in the area, and more and more so as Bagamoya expands and Dar es Salaam also. So we conducted this participatory diagnosis in seven communities and at the district level. Uh, in each community we worked with a, a woman and a men's group. Um, so the, the research team from University of Dar es Salaam um, did a sort of informal stakeholder analysis in each community to make sure that whilst we couldn't represent everyone, that these groups had sort of some representation from different gear users and so on and so forth. Um, and essentially we just facilitated a discussion around the, the four um, elements of the diagnosis framework, radar, um, split into livelihoods, people, population, environment, government structures and processes. So these discussions were facilitated with diagrams and so on. Um, and this aimed to define the fishery, identify the core threats and opportunities, and then prioritise the sorts of issues facing um, each community fishery. Um, in terms of an introduction to the project and why we were there, um, we essentially took two ideas from an ecosystem-based approach to management, um, one of which was this idea of looking at um, connections between inshore and offshore, uh, land and sea, and also north to south, south to north, dynamics along the coast. Um, the other idea was, uh, was about multiple stakeholders and having to balance kind of different expectations and interests of lots of different stakeholders in, in the 
area. Um, so this is us in one of the communities, that's um, Rose Mwapopo, who's a sociologist at the University of Dar es Salaam. Um, broad, broad discussion identified some issues and then a ranking exercise facilitated by the district fisheries officer. Um, this is the men's group. Now, the women were reluctant actually to use maps and draw and define the fishery. Um, so this um, ended up being a, an activity that we did with men's group fishers, um, as well as the issue identification and prioritization techniques. Um, so we used um, sort of Google Maps and other um, maps that we got from the U University of Dar es Salaam to draw where people were, were going to fish, trading, etc. Um, and these were, so these are the kind of outcomes from that community. Um, so you can see the sorts of issues that were discussed um, and then prioritised. Um, for women, um, a lot of the issues were around the fact that um, fish was increasing in price. So both because of uh, increased sort of scarcity of fish um, but also because of the move of men into trading. So, um, you know, it used to be women that, that did a lot of the trading, but now they found that they were only getting scrap fish, they didn't have as much capital as men, men were taking all the nice fish, and they were essentially getting competed out of a lot of the, the fish market. Um, for the men, um, a lot of the same issues around conflict of gear use. So here, um, there was a lot of use of illegal gear, so beach seine nets, um, ring nets, which have been both legal and illegal in Tanzania at various times and then uh, changed again, um, and interactions between them and those using more traditional sort of gill nets and um, traps and so on. Um, and then a lot of uh, the communities also talked about this erratic performance of institutions or the lack of um, functioning local governance um, and state governance. So they often um, reported that they would um, perhaps tell the government about people using dynamite and other illegal gears, and the next day these people would be out of jail and knocking on their door to have a word with them. So it wasn't a very secure environment in which to self-enforce and report on, on others. Um, So at the, at the district diagnosis, um, the methodology was a little bit more elaborate. We did uh, an ecological mapping to define the fishery and a social kind of network mapping um, to look at the stakeholders. Um, we had two groups and then they shared their sort of discussions with each other. We then moved on to looking at or defining ecological change and social change. And again, then the groups shared their, their findings. Um, before we then prioritised across the two sets of, of issues. Um, so this is the ecological mapping to define the fishery system. Um, participants were asked generally to describe the fishery, the, the types of gears, um, where they go to catch particular types of fish, um, where they land fish, where they market fish and so on. Um, and it was quite a fun exercise. We projected the map of Bagamoyo onto the wall with... Um, whatever, flip chart paper behind it so they could draw big, you know, roots along their, their fishery. Um, now, we're still transcribing and analysing data. We recorded um, all of the discussions on each of the group tables. Um, but just to give a few sort of preliminary thoughts, um, they essentially defined the fishery along existing administrative lines. But Bagamoya district is a very large district, so... Um, there are sort of ecosystem level um, dynamics taking place within that. So the types of fish um, which are shared or not between the sort of inshore and outer reefs um, and the gears that are used in those different places to catch um, the fish. So we need to do more to understand how pelagic fisheries are perhaps feeding into the inshore small scale fishery um, and so on. Um, there's lots of overlap in the day-to-day -day movement of fishes that you can see from these dotted arrows. Um, but they argue that there isn't conflict between communities because of this, um, but there is a lot of conflict over the different gear users. Um, and then 
the solid lines show um, kind of longer term or um, yeah, more consistent migration between fishing sites. So um, in two areas, they migrate up to Zanzibar and vice versa to fish or to the north, to Sudani, um, to fish. And, and um, in the case of Zanzibar, it's a different administrative jurisdiction, uh, which has a semi-autonomous government. So it makes for, uh, well, there is little collaboration between mainland Tanzania and Zanzibar at the moment. Um, but within an ecosystem approach to fisheries management, that would be something that you would have to um, address in terms of the different governments working in these, these regions. Um, the stakeholder analysis and network mapping was essentially to get participants to um, think about the different stakeholders and their interests when they then went forward to define the issues sort of characterising that fishery. Um, so I won't go into the, the details of that. Um, so they, each group identified a range of um, social change causes and, and consequences, um, and the sorts of things they talked about were uh, increase in number of fishers, decline in fish stock, uh, rise in the cost of living. Um, they talked about how um, the expansion of the township and the move of Dar es Salaam up meant that they were exposed to a lot more people, there was a lot more education, so in a positive sense there was a lot more exposure to ideas. Um, however, there were also problems with regards to people selling off land um, for tourism, for residential um, you know, buyers and so on. Um, with the ecological change, um, many of the things that you would expect, so depletion of mangroves uh, because of tourism and um, people requiring fuel wood, um, destruction of corals related to uh, destructive fisheries techniques uh, and land sea kind of issues, so siltation, um, sea level rise and shoreline erosion um, and changes in rainfall patterns. So almost all of these communities talked uh, about drought in their area. Um, yeah, uh, and then with each, so we, we then prioritised across both ecological and social issues, um, and you can see here the sorts of things that they, uh, the district level prioritised. So there's probably four that stand out: uh, decline in fish stock, destruction of corals, um, changes in rainfall, and depletion of mangroves. Now we have sort of similar data now from two groups within seven communities and the district level. And this is kind of the data that comes out of the diagnosis, right? Um, so there's a whole range of things, including um, sort of HIV, AIDS, and disease, um, the use of destructive gears, dynamite, um, moral decay, and people not valuing, valuing each other, um, and then your more traditional sort of decline in fish, depletion of mangroves, and so on. Um, now, to decide which issues we wanted to take forward into the next phase of the project, um, we didn't just aggregate up, because some communities, everyone would you know, prioritise a few issues and in, in others they would spread their votes, um, and we didn't want to um, sort of discount women's votes versus aggregate votes, etc. So we identified a couple of prioritised priorities from each community, men and women's groups, and the district. Um, and then through a lot of discussion with the University of Dar es Salaam, who'd done a lot of the, the work on the ground, um, decided to take forward four main themes. So decline in fish, loss of mangroves, governance, and women's livelihoods. Um, so going back to our sort of research and implementation framework, um, that was the participatory diagnosis, so we have an idea of what sort of issues characterise the fishing communities at each of these different sites. Um, according to this framework, the next step then is to identify your management constituency. Now by constituency, they mean um, stakeholders that have bought into the process, so um, who would then ideally take forward the actions. Um, so. Within Tanzania, we've decided not to create our own constituency, I guess, but to work within 
um, associations which are already present. Um, so earlier I showed that in Bagamoyo there are these small community sanctuaries that were initiated by USAID. There's also this um, collective kind of community conservation organisation which has representatives from each of the seven communities that have worked together in the past and want to continue to work together. So we work with this CCC and district representatives um, for the next phase of implementation planning. And then we're using a kind of nested approach where we work with the community CCC and then an integrated coastal management um, task force for years two and three. Um, the other countries have also identified various institutions that they'll, institutions being organisations or collectives of people, um, that they'll work with with the project going forward. Um, in this case, it was felt that these would cover the range of issues that were discussed. So if, for example, um, you know, land use change was a particular issue in a particular fishery, you might have a slightly different constituency to if um, destructive gears was the main issue that you were taking forward. So the constituency is specific to the, the range of issues that you want to address. Um, then there's a, a phase of sort of adaptive management. So within the scope of this project, um, what we've done is hold another workshop which uses the diagnosis data to identify some priority management actions. And from then we've identified a few pilot ones that we can do within our project. Um, there's a lot more information in some of these publications on the framework and its use in different contexts if anyone's interested. So um, we took forward the four issues. Um, this workshop included district level representatives plus members of the CCC, so members of every community that we've worked in already. Um, these were mixed and split into four groups, um, and each worked around a particular issue, so decline in fish or loss of mangroves. We represented some of the main ideas that had come out of the participatory diagnosis phase, and then participants started by brainstorming further the sorts of um, causes, consequences, linkages, drivers, and so on that were associated with these, with these issues. Um, we asked uh, the representatives or the participants um, two broad questions. So what needs to be done then to address the sorts of issues they've been discussing? and who needs to be involved. So they spent another couple of hours brainstorming that um, and had to finish by prioritising three, three issues that they thought were the management priorities related to that particular theme. Um, so for each one, they um, looked at the action, who should implement, whether there had already been any actions related to that issue, um, resources, risks, opportunities, and so on. Um, now, these are the three priorities that came up within each theme, um, and they're, um, you know, they're fairly typical of whatever. So when we got to the end of our workshop, um, we found that we were having a lot of responses that were very similar to the sorts of things which had been uh, already tried in the region, um, often suggested by NGOs and development agencies, um, and not particularly novel, but um, this is a stakeholder-led process, so we uh, spent some time trying to understand you know, what this meant and how we could use this in the project going forward. Um, so they talk a lot about this lack of education. They don't understand why the fish are declining, we don't understand why mangroves are declining, um, nobody understands the rules, etc., uh, etc. Et um, but there were a couple of points to this. So it's not just about ecological knowledge or knowledge of the environment, which makes up most of traditional environmental education. Um, but it was also about knowledge of policies, institutions, and more specifically, how to go about implementing them. So the communities felt that there was some awareness over this, but it was such an insecure environment in which to try and um, enforce and practice some of these institutions, and they didn't know how to address this. Um, 
Yeah, so it's, so it was partly about what sort of information is being shared, but um, also about how it was being shared and to who it was being shared. Um, in another sense, there was an argument that it isn't just about awareness, so it's more an issue of compliance and, and having to get more power into local level governance so that they could actually enforce a lot of the institutions which they were actually aware of, um, but couldn't um, kind of control within the local um, scale. Um, similarly, with regards to things like women's rights, there was an argument that uh, village and district government did know what these rights were. Um, they just so in terms of both women's rights to leadership and to land, and these were legislated, um, but village governments didn't uphold the rights, and women didn't know how to argue for their rights. So there are certain angles on this education idea that we can um, try and work with. Um, so we feel that there's an opportunity to explore whether there really is a knowledge gap um, and to understand what this constitutes. So is it environmental knowledge? Uh, is it knowledge of governance? Is it knowledge of um, you know, what to do and how to kind of activate your power? I guess. Um, and there's an opportunity to understand more about these local governance dynamics. Um, so how local governance represents communities, so who's kind of included and excluded in terms of uh, management, what the linkages are to government, um, and then the intervention may be something around how to support and empower communities um, with regards to local, local governance. Um, so we have three kind of activities that we're taking forward in Tanzania as part of our action implementation bit, um, one of which is very much around the supporting local governance. So trying to understand the history of community-based organizations in Bagamoyo, um, you know, what they're mandated to do, what they've actually achieved, how they might integrate different ecosystem-based management ideas. So um, there are some that are broad environmental groups, some that are fisheries specific. Um, you know, how are mangrove issues represented? There have been some mangrove projects in the area. Who's taking these forward? Who's representing these agendas and so on? Um, what would it mean if, if uh, management was scaled up? How would community-based organisations link to each other? Have they linked to each other before? Uh, and what is their relationship with government at various scales? Um, the second main one is about this knowledge gap to really understand whether it's there, whether this is some misconception on behalf of government or whether there is really a lack of understanding of you know the perhaps the interaction between mangroves and and reefs with regards to fisheries uh, or not um, so this is about ecosystem concepts but also um, about institutions do people understand bylaws do they understand how to um, enforce them um, do they understand the range of women's rights um, and so on and then we're also trying to see what we can do with regards to fisheries data. Now, there's very little that's been done in the region. We might have a few. Um, so that uh, there might be, um, you know, some fish catch data from 10 years ago. And if we do some fish catch data, we can say a tiny bit about the direction in which that has gone. But there's not a, a lot of data, so we're quite constrained in, in what we can say. Um, so we're trying to see if there's anything that can show us whether there has been decline in, in fisheries and mangroves, um, but also perhaps what the composition of the fishery is in terms of the pelagics versus um, coral reef species and so on. Um, now, expanding quickly to the other um, countries, um, so each of them went through their own version of this participatory diagnosis process um, to identify management um, priorities. Governance was identified in all four countries as being important uh, and being a priority issue and management action. But each country has and will approach this in slightly different ways. So the Philippines, for example, have developed this new alliance between six local government units and their implementing memorandum of agreements and so on between them. 
uh, and they're taking quite an active role in the sort of intervention that is the action research project. Whereas in Tanzania, we very much want to work with the institutions that exist and understand more about how those local institutions um, work with each other. Um, but these issues around governance can address some of the questions we had under Project Objective 1. Um, so how can an ecosystem-based approach build on what's already there and to what extent does what's already there reflect some of the principles in ecosystem-based management? Um, Indonesia, Philippines and the Solomons will also pursue some actions around mangrove rehabilitation and livelihood strategies um, specific to aquaculture. Um, now these countries are uh, somewhat different from Tanzania in that world fish um, work there, so have offices in Philippines and Solomon Islands, so they're drawing on other projects to expand the scope of what they can do within this one, so mangrove rehabilitation and aquaculture in both cases. Um, Philippines similarly, or oh, Indonesia as well, um, well, Indonesia and Philippines work very much within government processes to do ecosystem-based management already. So the project and um, team fits in within a broader set of priorities that government are taking forward, um, which include mangrove rehabilitation and um, aquaculture um, and sort of fish aggregating devices and, and things like that. Um, in Tanzania, we um, are fairly constrained by our budget, um, and also we, you know, there had been some mangrove rehabilitation projects in the area in the past, so we don't want to replicate uh, that, but we may try and understand what happened with those projects and how the local governance institutions um, interacted with those kind of projects to try and say something um, about how they, why they succeeded, why they failed, and so on. Um, so these, these kind of initiatives are trying to get a project objective too, so um, what sorts of strategies might address some of these ecosystem-based um, fisheries management principles and how kind of feasible are they within these contexts that we're working. Um, there are also questions about sort of what species are being replanted and so on. So in Solomon's, um, you have a mangrove species where the seed is eaten and sold and you have others which are important for firewood or biodiversity conservation and so on. So in these rehabilitation projects, who's deciding what, what's being replanted where um, and so on. Um, and then in Tanzania, we're taking forward this idea of the, the knowledge gap analysis to, uh, to, to respond, I guess, to district stakeholders um, and identify what actually the, the gap is um, and and then perhaps to design a more targeted intervention um, to address that. So we, as a project team, don't believe it's a lack of understanding of fish behaviour, um, but it is a more complex lack, uh, potential lack of knowledge of how to go about addressing the constraints in governance um, that, that these people face. Um, and, if, and if it's not an issue of... of education and lack of knowledge, then what are the constraints and um, how can they be addressed through, through local governance? Um, so I know this sounds like more of a to-do list than anything else, but we are just coming up to the end of the diagnosis and have been thinking about what we want to take um, forward into year two. Um, I just wanted to finish with a few broad observations, I guess, from, from where we've got so far. Um, this participatory diagnosis and adaptive management framework um, allows a similar methodology to be used, but we are working in quite varied contexts, which has been very clear throughout the project. Um, and the process has been very different in each country. Um, so Indonesia and the Philippines are working within very formal government processes, and the project is one tiny little speck in that, and they're trying to have to define you know, what their project comp contribution is versus what is just a huge government um, process. Um, but policy is moving towards this ecosystem-based fisheries management in these countries, um, building on integrated coastal management or integrating the two or something. They're figuring that out 
Um, in Solomons in Tanzania, um, the ecosystem um, approach to fisheries management will work or have to work if it does um, within this uh, co-management um, framework or community-based management framework. Um, so it's arguable that in some places, ecosystem-based fisheries management will be sort of evolutionary and incremental, um, but in other cases like the, the Philippines and Indonesia, it may be fairly um, revolutionary in terms of changing a lot of current structures uh, and policies. Um, the, in its normative sense, this dependence on scientific knowledge is a massive issue for the uh, context in which we're working. Um, so we uh, find it very hard to find um, fisheries data um, and so on, particularly when you're starting to look at links between mangroves and reefs or land-sea connections, connectivity along the coast. Um, the sort of investment in the Great Barrier Reef in trying to prove some of these connectivity issues is indicative of how much money can go into the research and science around these issues. So within these contexts, it might have to be enough just to work on assumptions like mangroves. Um, you know, if you replant and protect mangroves, you get better fisheries. If you um, have some level of spatial management, you protect fisheries and so on. Um, but what I find quite interesting is that there's a lot of knowledge around the social dimensions. So um, why destructive gears continue to be used and what the constraints are that stop people from changing those kinds of behaviours. Um, and this isn't often regarded as local knowledge or as part of the scientific knowledge um, realm, but there's a lot of information in communities as to these political dynamics and social dynamics and so on um, that can be brought into something like an ecosystem approach to management. Um, so in terms of defining the knowledge that we're using for ecosystem-based fisheries management, perhaps we need to expand from looking at ecological to looking at also social uh, information and knowledge of social processes. Um, and then we found very much in Tanzania that there's this kind of inertia around changing discourses. So we went through this whole sort of process and then we get to the stage where environmental education is the thing we need to do, which is um, the thing that's been advocated for <laughs> 30 years or something, um, and hasn't changed anything, really. Um, so we really need to question that in terms of our methodology and look at whether there are other ways that you can get um, stakeholders to think about more novel um, activities that you could trial within an ecosystem approach to fisheries management. Um, and this is one of the constraints in working through such a participatory um, process. So the sorts of things we're doing might not be what I would have done if I thought I would trial some ecosystem-based fisheries management tools, but we are led by the stakeholders that we're engaging with, um, and we're trying to then seek out some opportunities within these kind of old discourses that we can work with. Um, and that will be a long time changing, because a lot of these were people were trained in conventional fisheries management, um, They've heard the same old NGO rhetoric for the last 20 years. Um, and so we're just working with those kinds of constraints and issues. Right, thank you. Um, I, I just would appreciate any feedback going forward. And I, I know it's not a sort of typical results-based presentation that you hear here. Um, but I think the methodology that world fish are developing and trying to use in these places is kind of interesting, and we're struggling to um, identify research questions and sort of um, practical implementation things that we can do that are relevant to stakeholders at the same time. So thank you. Any questions? Very different things to different groups of people. Um, I think the terminology goes back to a shift in how um, fisheries managers operated. Where traditionally, they calculated uh, 
from fish tomography and catch information, maximum sustainable eel species by species. And, and that worked really well with things like the cod. Um, and so there was a shift towards a broader approach that recognized that you can't manage an ecosystem species by species because they eat each other. Um, so from my perspective as a current caring ecologist, ecosystem-based management recognizes those linkages between species, including people, in a sort of um, food web dynamic context. And it recognizes that when you deplete a stock, because people are harvesting it, um, it affects the, the function that that species performs in the ecosystem. Right? So depletion of herbivores means more seaweed, less corals, a less resilient um, ecosystem with, with human dimensions of that too, in terms of depleted ecosystem services. Right? You've presented quite a different view, I think, of ecosystem-based management in that you didn't mention anything to do with the ecosystem. So my question is, is ecosystem-based management just an excuse for the social sciences to push a co-management agenda, which they could quite legitimately push for reasons of poverty alleviation, but you, you didn't actually make a link to the ecosystem, and I'm not sure you need to. No, well, I, um, so yeah, this is um, very much a challenge that the project faces. And um, I mean, in the FAO kind of definition of ecosystem, um, it's, it is about these ecosystem linkages, but they're also trying to expand it to much more of an understanding of broad social. And the world fish interpretation of that is... Um, lots of different sources of vulnerability and opportunities for development and so on and so forth. We tried very much at the beginning within the diagnosis to introduce this idea of um, connectivity and ecosystem relationships and so on. Um, but at that level, it's a very broad discussion. Um, so uh, not a lot of ecosystem-based information came out of it. Um, one idea going forward within our gap analysis is to understand more about the multi-species fisheries, so the species which are being caught and how, how they might um, interact um, and what sort of um, outcomes have been found through decline of certain species and so on and so forth. Um, but it is difficult because I, I'm not sure how much of that is represented and reflected in local um, knowledge. So that's one question. Um, and there's very little uh, government or state um, science on these issues in this region. Um, so the project is struggling to represent the kind of ecosystem within in this project. Um, but I think... Uh, which makes it hard to know how this is different from an integrated coastal management approach, which is looking at, for example, tourism and fisheries, or this sort of sectoral integration. Um, but part of the challenge is about the information that's um, available. But I know that Tim, because Tim McKenna has that, uh, a fairly recent paper on some of that EVM stuff, doesn't he? So I need to look at it again. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I agree with the way Terry's thinking about the ecosystem, and I think that um, what are you what you were talking about at the beginning was because ecosystem-based management is such a large-scale thing, you can only apply it at a large scale, and I disagree for the reasons that Terry explained, because if you're working at a geographically quite a small scale, but you're dealing with the fact that different animals interact with each other, Terry can still do the ecosystem-based approach within a small scale. I had a question, though... Um, uh, how many uh, people from the different governments and institutions that you envisage would be like involved in managing the fishery were involved in your participatory processes? So we had um, quite a good mixture of people. So we had representation from district fisheries, so about three or four people from their national um, fisheries departments as well. 
Um, but then we also had um, people in normal district government, um, people looking at community development, gender issues, um, and so on and so forth. So not just fisheries stakeholders. Um, what, what we didn't have there is um, representation from Marine Protected Area Reserve Unit. So in, t in Tanzania, they, um, when it comes to community sanctuaries, these, the Marine Reserve Unit cannot participate unless they kind of legislate and own some of these areas. So Bagamoyo do not want them anywhere near their community sanctuaries. So that's the one, the sort of spatial management bit isn't represented, I guess, formally through a government participation. Yeah, Josh. Yeah, I wonder if you could reflect for a moment on whether your approach is necessarily evolutionary rather than revolutionary. And by that, I mean, did you have any surprises in what came up as, say, the four key priorities there? Because, you know, it looked like you got people to list a whole bunch of priorities and then, you know, ignored most of them and went with the four things I would have expected world fish to go with, which was governance, livelihoods, declines, mm. and fishing. I mean, was there, were you guys really constrained to make ecosystem based management? evolutionary by, by doing this approach? I mean, were those, again, were those four things uh, pre-decided or did those change well, as, um, as you did the process? So, w when, I, when I say evolutionary, I just meant that in Tanzania and Solomon's, whatever happens will be within current policy. So there aren't ongoing initiatives to change the full sort of structure of yeah. governance, whereas Indonesia and Philippines are different. Um, but in terms of also our, the issues and things that came up, um, the thing is, so whilst a lot of things may have been discussed, they weren't then necessarily prioritised by communities, so we're constrained in that the methodology says you go with what's prioritised. So those four things were what all the communities, whilst they may have discussed all sorts of uh, surprising and interesting things, um, then ranked these sorts of issues as the most important. But across all four countries, that was the same exact four issues, that get, which was oh, no, so, no, 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 those, sorry, those four were specific to Tanzania, but then in the, uh, um, yeah. mangroves and livelihoods in terms of aquaculture were the sorts of things that came up in the other countries too. Um, yeah. yeah, so they're not dictated by was... world fish, <coughs> Well, except in that the methodology has a structure. Um, but these are what the stakeholders in each of the four countries um, prioritise okay. as issues. Um, yeah, so I don't know whether there is an argument that you would choose the most unlikely or surprising issue to take forward. Um, but we haven't done that. Um, and it might be worth, because um, as I say, we're still working through a, a lot of the data, and it might be worth, because there's a lot of, um, I mean, I guess they're not surprising if you know some of the alternative literature on this, but a lot of issues around health, around land rights, and things which are interesting from a social point of view, but again, difficult from the ecosystem point of view. <laughs> to address. Yeah. Um, I just want to share a couple of insights that may from some work I did in Manas province in PNG, which was basically a social, cultural, economic uh, assessment of ecosystem-based fisheries mm -hmm. uh, management there. And uh, one of the things, and the, and the information is not available yet publicly, so, but one of the things that um, um, the team um, did before I even came and sort of coordinated the process, decided is that to basically you know, implement the ecosystem-based fisheries management approach, they really needed to understand the ecosystem connectivity that comes from land and sea at, at the point of actually understanding conceptual data of ecosystem integration. So rather than just going and talking to one uh, village, which was a marine-based community, we basically did the same participatory process is similar methodology, but we did, you know, in the forest, mm. and we did with the, the local communities at the marine areas. And in particular, we look at the perception of, from the groups, from the stakeholders, the perception of 
connections between those ecosystems and how important that is for sound ecosystem fisheries management. So don't know whether that, that is relevant you know, in your cases, but it was particularly useful to do that there, and we found particularly interesting information on, on how people themselves perceive that interconnection and the importance mm. for then sustaining a broader ecosystem management base, um, as Terry was mentioned. There was one thing. The second thing is your fourth area that you highlighted for Tanzania, which is women's livelihoods. And one interesting thing that we found there was that whilst it is exactly the same that the men are doing the bigger catch, particularly because they had fish aggregation devices there in particular, and they were going out with the boats, the bartering system, the informal bartering system, which is mainly you know, dominated by women, it was pretty strong, particularly in terms of you know, um, marine resources and inland resources. And that was keeping a network and also keeping women providing sort of for the, the household um, supplies and the household maintenance in ways that, you know, the team there didn't quite realize before. And that was also information that was being fed for larger planning processes. So perhaps, you know, um, looking at that more informal bartering system of, you know, um, resources, and the role of women on that in your know, women's livelihoods, um, mm. you know, area of work might be a quite interesting one that relates to that connectivity as well between, you know, land and sea. Mm. Yeah, I, I just um, so we we focused on coastal communities because it's rather than being an ecosystem-based approach, it's specific to the fisheries element. Um, but we did um, sort of suggest it. So we had pictures in all of the communities, which included pictures of, um, you know, forests and mangroves and rivers and connectivity from land to sea for discussion. Um, and yet the issues that they... And they did also identify sort of climate change-related issues, um, land use uh, change issues and so on and so forth within their full set of issues but then they didn't prioritize them as the most important so the most important so 